All right. Get this set up here. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm with Sapphire Energy, um, and we do algae. We do algae at very large scale from the entire value chain, from uh, biology, which is why we know Steve, uh, all the way through uh, uh, the end of the value chain for us, which is ultimately crude oil. And so I, what I'm going to talk to you today ab about is uh, the beneficial reuse of CO2 as an economic instrument, taking CO2 and turning it into something that's viable economically. We use the sort of pathway of algae to do that. And, and, and my view is, is that uh, is that renewable energy technology has uh, certain criteria for society that you all need to kind of think about. And that is, one is renewable energy technology, we really need to be addressing carbon as, as one of the functions of, of using renewable energy is to uh, have an impact on CO2. Uh, it, it, uh, in the United States in particular, the mantra around uh, uh, energy security is important, but also other industrialized nations care about energy security, and including uh, China cares about energy security. All nations care about energy security as a as sort of a, a, a capability of, um, of keeping their societies, as was mentioned earlier, um, whole and, and in power. And economic viability. All these energy strategies that we do put in place have to be economic. Uh, subsidies and other approaches, while maybe good in the early terms of developing technology and bringing them to the forefront to achieve various policy objectives, uh, whether that is CO2 mitigation or energy security or any list of other things, could be poverty. Uh, uh, economic viability, at the end of the day, once the subsidies go away, it has to be. That's just how business works. And I think it's important to level set the difference between oil as energy and electricity as power. One, we can st one is stored energy, one is nothing more than transmission. And I, I think that concept is sort of lost on, on especially policymakers, but it's co the concept of energy versus transmission or power is lost on many. Uh, and, and it's an important thing to understand because um, uh, purchasing a Prius is different than purchasing a, a plug-in electric vehicle. So let me take you through why I think that concept is important. And to me, uh, we have to make really good decisions around technology, especially as if we're focused on greenhouse gases. And so if you look at the, the chart up here, uh, your, your right, my left, I guess. Here we go. Uh, this is the global CO2 emissions from energy. And uh, you can see that tran the transportation marketplace, which is what we're here to talk about, is about 22% of global uh, CO2 emissions. Moving over to the next chart, 22% of, uh, again, 22% is global tra uh, CO2 emissions. Of that, passenger vehicles and light duty vehicle trucks comprise about um, uh, you know, half of the total emissions in, of, uh, for transportation. Moving over here, uh, uh, if you think about the, the installed base and the capability of actually addressing the marketplace, my thesis is, is that we can do a lot of different things uh, in passenger vehicles and light duty transportation, but heavy duty vehicles and, and other forms of transport uh, where you require um, more power um, are really from, a, from an economic standpoint going to be very difficult to achieve. So we need uh, energy dense fuels in particular to manage many of these uh, many of these sort of transportation modes. A classic example is air transport. We're not going to be using electricity, natural gas, or ethanol, or any, any other, uh, or batteries for that matter, uh, in, in, in that sort of transport. Now, uh, coming back to, to this graph, uh, and if you think about it, uh, if we were incredibly successful at electrifying transportation, uh, uh, and we did 175 million vehicles, the best case, and this is, by the way, the best case that almost all analysts can come to terms with, of, of achieving penetration of electric vehicles, uh, that, would, that would result in only 0.9% reduction in overall CO2 of transportation uh, total. The point is simply this, is that electric cars are great, but they aren't going to solve our big problem, which is we need to take this entire bucket of CO2 and we need to reduce the overall carbon impact of those fuels in total. 
Now that could mean eliminating vehicles totally, all transportation modes, but those aren't economically viable solutions. The truth is, is that we really need to take this entire pie and start to address that. And that's really where algae comes in. Algae is nothing more, it's a, it's a prehistoric, uh, it's, algae is nothing more than uh, prehistoric crude oil. All crude oil comes from algae, it's just 500 million years old. You're burning it in your car today. Sunlight, CO2, results in algae production that results in crude oil that we use today. That's the pathway that we're talking about in terms of algae. Now, from, a, from an economic standpoint, think about that two, mar two million barrels a day. I took two million barrels a day because many analysts believe that the, the most recent CAFE standards that have been put in place most recently by this administration, the Obama administration, will result in approximately a two million barrel a day reduction in crude oil demand. So let's, just taking that, that number, two million barrel a day reduction in crude oil demand, uh, results in a significant opportunity for job growth in the United States and other places. Uh, two million barrel a day uh, of production creates significant uh, GDP opportunities. Um, and also, uh, it also has a, a significant impact on our, on, on our energy security capabilities, uh, domestically and, and abroad. Uh, but also, it will have a significant impact in terms of overall reductions in, in CO2. So if you just take algae, and if it was the only technology you use, which I don't advocate, we have to, we have to apply all technologies to the problem of carbon, not single technologies. These are, this is the, one of the world's biggest problems we face. Uh, then uh, right off the top, you can account for approximately, depending on production systems and the capabilities, energy efficiency that's built into those projects, approximately 60 to 70 percent reduction in overall CO2. Uh, that's a substantial uh, bogey uh, to uh, accomplish in transportation fuels. Now let's look at the life cycle analysis of uh, and the boundaries associated with algae in particular. And, and this is uh, typically how we generate electricity today. We take coal, we burn, uh, we burn it, we produce electricity, it re results in CO2 emissions. This could be natural gas, the same, the same um, life cycle uh, occurs. We also take crude oil, we extract it, we produce it, we produce, uh, we, uh, and we crack it into the three distillate fuels, gas, diesel, jet, or naphtha. Uh, the bottom line is, is that coal produces about one unit, uh, crude oil produces about one unit, notionally. And, which is a total of two units of, of carbon. Now let's take a look at algae production as a function of CO2, uh, where we actually consume the CO2, the anthropogenic sources. We take C anthropogenic sources of CO2. By the way, the rate limiting factor in algae's growth is access to CO2. So uh, in order to be commercially produce <coughs> algae into transportation fuels, which is quite a bit different than other types of technologies, uh, we need to have access to large amounts of CO2, about 14 to 15 kilograms of CO2 per every gallon of algae crude oil produced. So substantive amounts of, of, of CO2 can be consumed. What does that mean? So we consume the CO2. Uh, you can get a pretty much of a one-for-one -one benefit. Uh, you, uh, it, you grow algae from the CO2 that's generated from a coal-fired power plant. You green up the power or reduce the overall carbon footprint of the of that particular facility. Uh, and by the way, you store that, you store that uh, CO2 at night in the form of urea, which again can be used as a source of nutrient for the algae ponds. Uh, we do need some sources of urea uh, in the form of, it's a fertilizer, essentially. Uh, and then you offset, uh, some say one to one, but it's actually one to 0.8. So you get about 1.8 gallons of, of refinable distillate fuel uh, per, excuse me, barrels of distillate fuel per, uh, you know, per, uh, as a trade-off to the amount of oil that you would bring out of the ground. So the ratio of 1.8 to 1 uh, barrels, of, uh, barrels of crude oil in the ground to 1.8 of ba barrels produced from crude oil uh, via the algae pathway. So it's a substantive uh, 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 a method to both reduce carbon uh, from, a, from an anthropogenic source, but also displace um, the use of, of, of crude oil that we get that's 500 million years, years old from the ground. 
Now, looking at it a little broader, and, and um, you can see that um, you, if we were to take the, those same numbers uh, of carbon uptake and consumption, uh, and uh, you can see that over uh, the years, uh, substantial amounts of CO2 uh, are eliminated from, from the atmosphere. Um, and if we were to uh, simply, uh, if we were to simply uh, take this, these metrics here, a reduction of uh, replacement of annual petroleum consumption by 25 percent, uh, that would be a savings of almost 5 billion metric tons of CO2, uh, eliminating about 80 percent of the CO2 emissions for 2007, for example. Uh, that would be equal to uh, shutting down all of the coal plants in the U.S. for two years. Uh, it will also be equal to taking all passenger vehicles off the road for four years. So uh, the, the use of algae as an alternative uh, source of uh, dense hydrocarbon transportation fuels is a viable technology. And the techno-economics are actually catching up um, uh, for the technology that we've developed. So why algae? Well, well, first of all, it's, as Steve pointed out, it's one of the most photosynthetically efficient plants on the planet Earth. All energy comes from the sun. You want to have an efficient uh, biomass or plant that actually converts that, uh, those photons uh, 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 to, to energy. Um, it's scalable. Um, we, we have the ability to grow it at very large scale. Not only does the organism naturally uh, uh, produce large amounts of biomass per acre uh, compared to other sources, uh, but, it also, uh, but it also produces the types of, of uh, carbons and the, the chain links and the hydrocarbons that we're used to using in our infrastructure today that some other uh, presenters have uh, uh, marked out at about $12 uh, trillion, which I would agree with. We also have the ability to take algae and, as I showed you earlier, consume uh, the CO2 from an anthropogenic source uh, and then uh, utilize that in the production of of fuels, uh, so we consume CO2 in the production of uh, uh, growing algae. Uh, we uh, we have a CO, uh, CO2 emission in terms of uh, transportation and refining, and then we combust that that um, that high, uh, highly dense carbon, uh, and we result in a transportation fuel. But overall, on a life cycle basis, with these boundaries, we have about a 60 to 70 percent reduction in overall CO2. Again, we're attacking the entire pie, not just a small percentage of the problem. Um, as it relates to uh, algae, it's, it's a sustainable uh, agricultural uh, technology where we uh, use non-arable land and, and non-potable water. And uh, our current demonstration, which I'll show you in a, in a bit, we're using a brackish salt water in the New Mexican desert. Um, uh, and uh, algae actually likes high saline conditions, high pH conditions, waters not suitable for agriculture, uh, not suitable for human or animal consumption. And as it relates to the price, we're all focused here on the marginal barrel of oil today. These are all the new sources of crude oil, uh, and, and that's exactly where we should be focused on. So uh, algae is competitive today uh, uh, from a CapEx uh, standpoint. Uh, uh, with uh, these sources of, of uh, 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 these new sources of, uh, of, of crude oil in the world. Here's our project. This is uh, the uh, in integrated algal biorefinery. It's in the New Mexican desert, a little town called Columbus, New Mexico, right on the U.S.-Mexican border. Right up here is Mexico, literally a quarter mile from the edge of the ponds here. Uh, this, is a, this is one mile by a quarter mile. This is a very substantive size in terms of scale. Uh, uh, we uh, actually, once this is fully built out, this is a first module of two more. Be about 300 acres when we complete. We'll consume about 50 metric tons of CO2 uh, per day. Uh, and uh, we'll consume, um, uh, and of course, uh, 13 to 14 kilograms of CO2 uh, uh, per gallon of green crude or algae oil uh, produced. Uh, we grow it in very large open pond systems. Um, well, these are two acres. These are some of the largest ponds in the world. Uh, these are one acre ponds. These are twos. Uh, all of that lining goes away uh, in the next installations of this technology. We use world scale technology today that is in, in use in almost every wastewater treatment facility in the world to harvest algae very efficiently. Uh, we then uh, return the biomass, uh, or excuse me, return the spent 
uh, the spent biomass uh, to this process. We recycle all the nutrients that we can out of the algae to supplement our nutrient load, uh, and therefore the requirement for additional fertilizers is uh, not as necessary. Uh, and we take all the raffinate, which is the green water uh, that has little tiny but very dilute algae cells in it, and return it back to the pond system so uh, we don't actually use uh, water uh, in the process. We do, uh, we do use water um, uh, from, a, from the standpoint of uh, evaporative loss, uh, but water is not necessarily part of the process. And it results in this, which is crude oil. And uh, just, two, just two weeks ago, we announced uh, that we'll be selling, we are selling this crude oil here uh, to Sorrel. They will be running it, co-processing it with the uh, typical crude oil you get from any region of the world uh, in their refineries somewhere here on the West Coast. So the ultimate, thank you, the ultimate, uh, it is exciting, I agree. It, it, the ultimate product is uh, the three distillates, gas, diesel, jet, but uh, but algae is really optimized to provide for diesel and jet fuel alternatives. The uh, you know, waste streams uh, in the refining world we would consider naphtha and gasoline a waste stream. You see dramatic drops in the use of, in gasoline uh, globally, uh, and, um, uh, and so we think the fuels of the future, at least as it relates to those that are using liquid hydrocarbons, will be diesel and jet fuel. So. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. That's a nice sunny morning uh, in algae land in Columbus, New Mexico. Thanks very much.